Taylor Mason, and I'm here today with Representative Donna Bullock, who is the 2021-2022 Chair of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus. This is an ongoing oral history project on the PLBC, diversity within the House, and its impact on members and staff. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Taylor. Okay, so why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got to the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Sure. So, I am a Jersey girl. I grew up in New Jersey, uh, came to Philly to go to law school, fell in love with Philly, fell in love with Philly God, made it home. Um, and, you know, I um, grew up from, in modest means. Um, my, my family struggled, my mother, my grandmother and I, um, we frequented a uh, soup kitchen in New Jersey to get by. And in that experience, my grandmother taught me that while I was here to get a meal, I also had to serve. So I learned to volunteer at a very early age. And that carried on throughout my career, mm -hmm. through education and college, and eventually coming to law school and graduating and saying, how can I give back to my community? So I worked at Community Legal Services. I um, found a way to use my law degree to serve my community, representing mostly nonprofits and churches and schools and after school programs but always wanted to do more in um, government. And so I had a great opportunity to work for Councilman Daryl Clark in Philadelphia, um, where I worked at his, initially as his community economic development coordinator, and then eventually um, became his special assistant when he became the council president, and worked for him for about four and a half years. Uh, during that time, uh, my predecessor had resigned early, and I, um, folks encouraged me to run for that seat. And I'll be honest, at first I didn't want to. Um, you know, I talked about, you, you know, I tell folks all the time that I definitely was the girl in high school that ran for every mm -hmm. possible class opportunity or leadership, but as I got older and settled down and became a wife and a mother, those became my priorities. And so running for office was not at the top of my list at the time, but um, looking back at that time, I, I said, okay, listen, my community is looking for a leader. Am I in a position to lead? Are, is my family okay with that? I looked at those, my boys who are now teenagers, but at the time I was like, okay, they can tie their shoe, they can, they can get around, they, they don't, they're not fully dependent on me, and so this was a great opportunity for me to run. That was in 2015 um, that I ran. It was a special election in the August of 2015. So, what has been your experience being a person of color in the House? Do you think there's been extra um, work involved to get elected, or even when you're here in the House to get legislation notice, to get your voice heard, things like that? Yeah, I think that it, you know, whether there's a, there's part of it that is there's more you have to do, there's extra, right? There is a level of, of making sure that your voice is heard, that your voices of your constituents are heard, but it's also that you just have to move differently, I think, in the house, right? And or in this entire complex. And uh, one of the things I noticed right off the back is how few women of color there were. Uh, and it's a number that I talk about all the time, and um, and we'll continue to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But I think it was very important to me was that when I got here, there were nine black women, um, and that number remains constant. Um, and uh, there, that number has not changed, and I think it may have, it may still be the highest number of women to serve, not uh, of black women to serve at one time. Okay. Um, and uh, at one point, there were 13 white guys named Mike. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is a number that I repeat all the time, mm -hmm. that there was a point in which I served where there were more white guys named Mike, and that just illustrated for me some, some of the um, challenges that may not necessarily be spoken, but I think are there, you know, making sure you're seen and you're heard and you're included, mm -hmm. because you're sent here to represent your 60,000 people back home, and so you can't be left out of those meetings because, you know, it's, it's the old guys, you know, white guys, you know, network over, you know, cigars or whiskey, mm -hmm. and they're not including you. And those things still happen. Um, I think, you know, the combination or the intersection of being both black and a woman has really um, colored how I 
how I interact with my colleagues and how I make sure that I don't leave those identities emphasized. Like some folks will like to say, oh, I'm colorblind or these, don't, don't, these things don't matter, but they do. They very much so do. And so I'm not shy about pointing the fact that I'm black, that I'm a woman, that I'm only five feet tall, <laughs> right? Because these things are, my, are part of my identity and they shape mm -hmm. not just, you know, um, who you see when I walk in a room, but they shape my experiences, they shape the values that I have, they shape, you know, how I look at legislation and policy, um, and it shapes how I see that legislation and policy impact in my community, mm -hmm. you know? Or, um, Yes, I'm black and I'm a woman, and a substantial number of my voters are too. And so um, they are walking in the same shoes that I am. They are raising children in Philadelphia. They are putting food on their tables. They are trying to you know, hold down their family while dealing with just the burden that we almost become accustomed to, the burden of systemic racism and all these, you know, fancy titles and words that we want to give it, whether it's, you know, injustice or systemic racism or all these inequities and historic disparities. The reality, th those things happen every single day in somebody's life. And um, while I'm trying to address this, these institutional issues, I need to figure out how to put, how to help that mother put food on the table today, right? Mm -hmm. And so those are always um, things that guide me. When I first got here, and I always said that I was here to make things better for my sons, right? I wanted them to have quality health, um, a, a, a child care, pre-K. They were at that age where they were in pre-K. It was all about, you know, universal pre-K. And it was about addressing lead and, and asbestos in schools and, and, and those kinds of things. And those mm -hmm. things are still so much important to me. But now that they are preteen and teenager, and I see them going out into the world, it's now about, are they safe? Mm -hmm. So now gun violence is more like of a priority for me than it had been in the past because my 14 year old wants to walk down the street, down the street where he sees the mm -hmm. memorials of balloons and candles, down the street where during the middle of the day there could be a shooting that he has nothing to do with, but he can be walking through that, mm -hmm. right, that moment and that, um, so that, that that's become important to me. And, and just all of the other issues that we talk about here, you know, opportunity and education and you know, the disparities in healthcare and how there's going to, how those things will impact them as they become young adults. Um, and so, yeah, how do I see, you know, how do I act or how do I feel myself being received as a person of color and particularly as a black woman? All of that comes to play. And mm -hmm. it, 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 it's really interesting because I, I, I want to hope, like, have this faith that my colleagues aren't biased and my colleagues don't have these, these you know, hidden prejudices. But it comes up in the mm -hmm. smallest of ways, but it still comes up. So I was recently doing an interview with a, a, a local TV station and the conversation came up about um, about the about our current president appointing a black woman to the Supreme Court, and this was a week or two be before it happened. And the the I guess I can mention because it's, it's out there. Uh, yeah. Joey B from says his name from face the face the states. Mm. He says to me, um, would I take a job if I knew that the one of the reasons why I was being considered is because I was a black woman. Hmm. <laughs> and I just can only think like, do you think that maybe you got the job because you was a white guy? Like that yeah. happens every single day. Yeah. And, 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 and for some reason, you know, um, we're, you know, black women are supposed to take some kind of moral ground or some high moral ground of not taking opportunities that are presented to them that have not been presented to them for so many, so many years. So mm -hmm. it just really hit me. Um, it struck a nerve when he asked that question because, yeah, just because. Sure, <laughs> no, I, t I understand. And thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned your district, the 195th, which um, 
Its predecessors were Michelle Brownlee and Frank Oliver. So what's it like being such, in such serving in such a historic district where its other members are also very well known? Right. You know, Frank Oliver served that district for 37 years. 37 years. Mm -hmm. um, and Michelle Brown served for about six or seven, but she also worked for him during most of his, his ten term. And so there, there had been somewhat of a transition for the district um, in my leadership when I came in. And, 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 you know, Frank Oliver's name still carries a lot of weight in the district. Mm -hmm. Folks who remember him, the things that, that he's done for you know, them or their grandmother, they'll come by and they'll tell me these stories. Um, and know that I believe Mr. Oliver was a former chair of the Black Caucus. So there's these, definitely this history of, you know, um, the earlier um, members, black members in this house. And he was a part of that early group, right? The mm -hmm. group in the 70s that started the Black Caucus that were um, fighting for some of the same issues that we're fighting for today, right? But they were very vocal at a time where um, there were things happening not just in the Commonwealth but across our country and they were a part of that movement. So I, what is really um, humbling is that I see the work that he and others during the 70s have done, how they have somewhat set this foundation for the work that we're doing now in 2020, 21, and 22, you know, in the movement, of, in the Black Lives Matter movement, in the you know, racial justice and equity, social, you know, social justice movement that's happening right now in this country. There's so mm -hmm. many parallels, and then there's there's so much there, there are a lot of lessons we can learn from what they did then. But I also think we're in a better position now to to really move the needle on on these issues. Um, so I know that I I am standing on his shoulders and the shoulders of many others that have come before me. It's an honor to represent um, his district or this district where he has been. Um, and to continue, you know, um, you know, moving forward, just moving mm -hmm. forward in that path. So uh, it's such a great district. It's diverse in itself. And to have um, a district that is as diverse as it is be so supportive of a representative that is very focused on racial justice and social equity. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, they're all the way behind me and supportive of that work and understanding that it has to happen there. So you mentioned your predecessors. Did they play a mentor role for you? Did they work with you when you got elected to the office? If you could just elaborate on that. So Michelle Brownlee was very um, helpful early on in, in my um, career. I actually would say um, right before I even considered being, you know, running for the seat and she was still the state rep, we had a working relationship with each other because mm -hmm. I was in the councilman's office. So she would call for, you know, city services that she needed for her constituents at the time. So we were building this relationship. And when I um, decided to run in, um, in her, after her resignation, it was, it was great to have her support because mm -hmm. she didn't have to. And I know that she, it was a challenging time for her, mm -hmm. um, but she, she found a way to be supportive without being harmful to, to, to my election. And even with the challenges that she was facing at the time, um, I saw value in the work that she had put in before me and value in, in her service and knowledge that helped prep me for being here. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're able to see that value and get beyond you know, the other things that may be going on, it, it really was helpful. And Mr. Oliver and I, we started off a little different. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't the candidate he necessarily wanted to support okay. at first. And so, um, but he was always honest with me. Okay. And then um, and then when I beat his candidate, <laughs> he, he was such a, this is the great guy. He called me and he said, girl, you beat me. <laughs> now let's get to work. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, he welcomed me into his home. He sat down with me. He talked to me. He shared history with me. Um, and it was, a, you know, I think with maybe a year or so that I had with him just really being a great mentor, even after, like, having that election day battle. Mm -hmm. Like, after election day, it was all, like, now how are we going to how are we going to make you an effective legislator? How are you going to make sure you do what's right for our district? Mm -hmm. How can I be supportive? And, and, and I appreciate that because um, at I think for Mr. Oliver, at the end of the day, it was about the people. 
you mm-hmm. know, and even though he had a candidate that he would have liked to have seen one, it was like, okay, she won. So how do we support her? How do we, and I never had a problem with him after that. In fact, I would say, like I said, that last year was just uh, very valuable to me to have him. Um, and it was an honor for me to name a street after him okay. after he passed away. Um, yeah, you know, again, finding value in folks even when you don't agree on every every piece. And there's politics or politics, right? Mm-hmm. You get out there, you, you support your candidate, and but at the end of the day, it, it's about the people we serve. So you, you put all the election day, you know, stuff to the mm-hmm. side, and uh, you work together. And Mr. Oliver was good about that. Okay. How about people outside the 195th? Were there other members that were iconic in Philly or across the state that really helped you um, when you started in office? Um, We were talking about members. Yes. So, um, yeah, um, when I decided to run, uh, one of the first phone calls I got was um, from Sherelle Parker. Okay. Um, And Sherelle Parker called and she gave me some advice. She told me who to talk to and um, in, the, in the HBCC, and then when I got elected, she told me who to talk to to, to help me with, you know, uh, media, and help me with writing my newsletters and getting legislation done, and um, she was very helpful, and, and she had she was still here, but was preparing to leave to go to council, so I think okay. that was great. Um, Dwight Evans, when I first got elected, he, he welcomed me to his, uh, I would call them private caucuses, <laughs> so <laughs> when we had our our general caucus when we were discuss bills and, and all us the Democratic caucus, um, Dwight had these separate meetings in his office where he invited a few members and they hmm. would go over bills and talk about you know how things are getting moved and what's in the budget and it was very helpful to to be in that space again he was preparing to run for Congress so he was on his way out so to be able to get a year um, of service with him and to learn all mm-hmm. that he had all that knowledge that he had from his years of service. It's interesting, I always seem to get this like last year of people before they move on to yeah. their next chapter or um, a journey and, and, and so, but I got an opportunity to, to work with Sherelle and, and Dwight Evans towards the end of their terms here um, and uh, that was really helpful. Um, and then I, I would say uh, all of the members who were already here were very very okay. welcoming, you know, Kinsey and Jordan Harris, um, you know, those two in particular, I think were very welcoming and, and, and helpful when I first got here and uh, as, um, as members of the Black Caucus. And then and, and Senator Hughes. Okay. And Senator Hughes would invite me over. He was very supportive in my campaign and invite me to, he has a radio show, so he would mm-hmm. invite me on a radio show and still does from time to time to talk about issues. Um, and then, you know, he he has a Tuesday lunch that we go over for, and my question is always, well, is, is it lunch that has hot sauce? Because if it's not <laughs> with me, it's fried chicken, right? So if there's no hot sauce on the table, then I don't want anything. <laughs> but, so that's our running joke, he'll say, mm-hmm. I got lunch with hot sauce. And so, um, but yeah, he, he has been one of those other folks that if I didn't understand what the process or the legislative process okay. initially, he was there to break it down and really explain it to me. That's interesting. Okay, so moving now into the Black Caucus itself. Um, how have you been involved in the past, and then if you want to discuss your current chair position? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So after my first term, I, I was a, I was a member of the caucus initially. Vanessa Brown was here, okay. um, and she, you know I supported her her leadership and things that she wanted to do, and then um, then Representative uh, Jordan Harris ran for. Black Caucus Chair and asked me to serve as its vice chair. Okay. So um, that would have been in 17. 17. Yes, I think so. 17. Um, so I served as his vice chair for two years, and then Rep. Kinsey ran for chair, and I served as his vice chair for two years. Okay. And then, um, then I said, all right, guys, it's my turn to be the chair. Yeah, move over. I'm tired of being a supportive <laughs> role. I mean, look, look, and I, 
we've had black women in leadership at the caucus, but I'm the third black woman in, in mm -hmm. that position. Leanna Washington, Vanessa Brown, and now myself. Yes. And uh, you know, you start looking around, and you're like, you know, black women are always in a supportive role in in, uh, in all the movements, right? We're mm -hmm. behind the, all the movements, and I'm like, no, we're not going to keep. I'm not going to keep being <laughs> the supportive role. I'm a great vice chair, but I can lead as well. And mm -hmm. so it was a great opportunity for me to. Um, step in that role. Look, uh, Brett Harris and Kenzie are amazing leaders, and and I enjoyed working with them, and, and supporting their initiatives. And but I, I was ready to take over. Yeah. <laughs> I, some would say I probably already was taking over because I just told them what to do. Anyway. <laughs> um, they listened very well. Um, but no, it, it's um, yeah. So it's it's it was a time you know to be able to lead this caucus during this time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, you know. Uh, as I mentioned, that where we are as a country and the heightened sensitivity to some of the issues that we wanted to believe are already fixed. We wanted to believe we were beyond in this country and realizing that we still have a lot of work to do when it came to racial um, and social justice. And, and so um, with that sort of heavy, heavy responsibility, um, I understood that, you know, we needed leadership that was ready to deal with some of that, and I was ready to, to step in that role and do it. Mm -hmm. um, and to be unapologetic about it. So when I decided to run this term for the Black Caucus Chair, I knew it meant um, being very bold and very, um, just, just as I'm unapologetic about being black, being a black woman, and fighting for the issues that impact black and brown people in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And they, you couldn't hide, you had to be upfront, you had to say it, you couldn't beat around the bush, you couldn't soften it up because of somebody's feelings, like, had to. And, and one of the sort of jokes I, I go back home and I tell my husband, I said, I think folks, I scare folks a little bit because I come off all soccer mom <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> hey, yeah, the boys are fine. Come in real soccer mom, soft, you know, PTA mom. And then I come in hot. <laughs> and it's like, oh, wait a minute, we weren't ready for that. So I, I disarm folks, but I, I think it's, you know, it's about being cordial at first, of course. And I'm still that person. and. Um, and we're friends, but when we want to talk about these issues, mm -hmm. I, I don't have time to, to be cordial. Like, th these are real life issues that are impacting people's lives today. You know, that there are children who are going to schools that are severely underfunded. There are families that are, you know, not getting adequate health care, and women who are losing their lives giving birth. And a lot of those issues are because of an equity built from bias and racism. It just is what it is. Mm -hmm. Great transition mm -hmm. into what are some of the issues that has been worked on in the past and what do you hope you will see in the future? Oh, goodness. It's very open-ended. It so is. You, you can't probably cover everything. No. I think, you know, here's, here's the thing. Unfortunately, a lot of the issues that I believe my predecessors in the 70s were talking about are still issues today. Yeah. We are still talking about criminal justice reform. We are still talking about police reform. Yeah. We are still talking about education, fair funding formulas and quality education across the board for, and access to education. We're still talking about healthcare and the injustices in healthcare. You know, Dr. King has a quote about the biggest injustice is healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we we are talking about that in a pandemic in 2022 now, you know, two years into a pandemic, and seeing how just in healthcare alone, there are so many systemic and institutional in inequities in that system that has serious implications. Mm -hmm. right? during, during the COVID-19 pandemic, it is black and brown folks who disproportionately tested higher for COVID, disproportionately were hospitalized for COVID, and unfortunately lost their lives due to COVID. They were uh, more than likely to be the folks on the front lines 
working the jobs to get your groceries to your home, delivering those groceries through whatever app you're using in the comfort of your home, more likely to be the person taking care of your child at a child care center, more, li more likely to be taking care of your elderly parents mm -hmm. at the nursing home or at the hospital. It, it has always been, unfortunately, black and brown communities who disproportionately share the, the burden of our biggest mistakes in this country. And so when we do that, intentional or not, the policies that we work on in this building, that we work on in state capitals across this country, and that we work on in DC, have this impact, they have this effect. And so one of the things that I hope to work on is to be more strategic about how we fix it, mm -hmm. right? And because trust me, I think folks are strategic about <laughs> keeping us locked out of those things, right? You know, some of these things are unintentional. Some of them are very much intentional. So if we are intentional about fixing it, we can't just go around and say nice words like equity and diversity for the next 10 years. We can't, we're not gonna get anything done. I don't wanna see reports for the next 10 years. And so I, I did introduce a, a bill to require or to establish uh, an agency or office that would conduct equity impact statements for legislation. And this is why. We get these fiscal impact statements on every bill. We know how that bill is going to impact the state budget. Mm -hmm. We know how that bill will impact our state's finances. We don't know, we don't have anything on paper anyway other than testimony or somebody get on the floor or maybe somebody writes a nice op-ed. We don't know how the bills we introduce, the policies we advocate impact people. How does it impact people of color? How, do, how does your bill impact women? How does your bill impact low-income families in Pennsylvania? How does your impact bill impact rural communities versus cities? We don't know because we don't necessarily do that work for every single bill. Mm -hmm. So unless you have an advocacy group or somebody else that's doing that work or you've done it as a legislator, we're not getting that impartial you know, uh, account of how what we do impact our biggest asset in the Commonwealth. Budget's great, but our biggest asset is our people, mm -hmm. is Pennsylvanians. So um, I hope that we, whether it's that bill or in other ways, I think moving forward, I would just like to see whatever we do, whether it's on healthcare or prison reform or you know um, education, that we are doing it through a lens. You know, we can call it a racial equity lens. We can call it, you know, whatever is the term for this this season, but a people lens. Mm -hmm that we are looking at the people of this commonwealth, every single corner of the commonwealth and saying, how is what I'm doing today? If I press yes, that green button at my desk, who am I helping and who am I hurting? And I think that's important to know. Okay. Um, mentioning an event that the Black Caucus worked on back in 2020, when the Black Caucus took over the rostrum, um, after a lot of gun violence in the country. Could you explain that moment? Were you present? Were you yes. involved in the organization of it? So I, um, this was an event in response to uh, police, act, police abuse and, and, and um, activity, and um, particularly George Floyd's death mm -hmm. um, and the national attention it had in our country. Several, we were still, most of us were still home because we were in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so um, we wanted to respond in some way. We wanted to move legislation that many of us had already been working on after the death of a, 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 a young man, a boy outside of Pittsburgh. Um, his name's escaping me at the moment. But um, there was a police shooting of a boy in uh, just outside of Pittsburgh in 2018, I want to say, okay. and that had that had at that time had motivated a lot of Black Caucus members to introduce or reintroduce bills that many of us or our predecessors had worked on to address police accountability, 
police trans um, uh, transparency and, and to address you know some of the abuses that we had seen in law enforcement. So those bills have been sitting since 2018, 19, 20, and now here we are in 2020, and we're still not seeing our bills get moved. We're in the minority as a party, so we just weren't seeing those bills get moved. And here we see this national story that just it just punched the whole country in the gut. Like we got to do something here, um, and so. Uh, one of our members, Rep Lee, started calling it everyone saying we should do something, Rep Summer Lee. And she called me and I was like, yeah, we should definitely do it. I was not able to come up because of COVID. I was okay. home caring for um, the children and my mother and I didn't want to expose myself mm -hmm. at the time. But many of the members did and I, I supported them from home. I you know, streamed it on my social media accounts. Um, I you know, called other members to see who would be able to attend. Um, and I think it was important because it was, a, it was a moment for us to say, again, like, you cannot ignore these voices. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's you know, the 20 plus, almost 30 members between the House and Senate of, of, of members of color. We can't continue to ignore the bills that we've been putting out here. Like we could have addressed this um, at least in the Commonwealth. And I think what was important is that the action we took here in the House was, was in conjunction with all of the actions that were happening across the Commonwealth in small communities and small boroughs and townships. You saw people you know, protesting or rallying and speaking to their legislators saying, what are you doing in regards to police reform? And when those questions were being asked of legislators who may not have ever thought that police reform was important to their districts, could now turn to the Black Caucus and say, well, what, what, what do you have? Glad you asked. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of bills around police reform that we would like to take a look at. And because of that action and because of the work of the people of the Commonwealth, because it wasn't just about what we did here in the state capital, it was about what folks were doing in, the, in these towns all across the Commonwealth. Because of that work, we were able to pass two bills that we think moved some of those police reform discussions a little further. Antoine Rose is the name of the young man that was yeah. shot in Pittsburgh. So you get old, it comes back to you at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't that old, but I'm getting there. So, um, but you know, with the shooting of Antoine Rose and the murder of George Floyd, it gives an opportunity to push those things further and continue to have the conversations about police reform. You know, we're, we have you know, more bills and we hope it doesn't take another death to get those mm -hmm. bills moved. We hope it doesn't take you know, another loss in some other space for us to move a health care bill or prison reform bill or uh, address other issues that the Black Caucus is working on. Um, but that unfortunate circumstance in our country's history opened up a window for us to, to push those bills through. And uh, hopefully we can continue to work on such, you know, just as meaningful bills without the, the um, unfortunate circumstance of people having to lose their life to get there. Like, yeah. My last question then is, how has, this, how has your service with the PLBC impacted your overall house service? Oh. <laughs> um, I, I think that it, it has probably isolated me from some of my colleagues. Okay. I'll, I'll be honest because um, because I'm so outspoken at this point in my career, um, some folks aren't, they don't know how to engage with that. So, or I don't know what it is, if it's fear or whatever mm -hmm. maybe. Um, but in other ways, it's, so while it's isolated me from some folks, I, there, others have looked to me for the answer. 
Right. Mm -hmm. So there are some who, some of our colleagues who are like, hey, I don't know what to do here, but I have a feeling that this may have like some impact on black and brown communities. What do you think? And so to be, mm -hmm. to be that resource for some of my colleagues is, 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 um, it's an honor, it's a responsibility, mm -hmm. right? It's a lot of work. So so it's it's created more work for me, right? Yeah. As the chair because um, I'm seen as that voice and, and that's you don't want to be the sole voice for all black and brown folks of the Commonwealth. I mean black folks from Erie and Easton and you know, Philly and Pittsburgh are all different, but just like any other, you know, group in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. We all we're not monolithic in that way, but um, you know, it's it's a heavy burden to to make sure you're speaking in a way that is reflective of the diversity of just black and brown folks in Pennsylvania. Like their diverse experiences. We have farmers and we have teachers and we have folks who, who work in tech and folks who have families and folks who are independent. So it's just as diverse as the Commonwealth is, so are are, are we as, as black and brown folks as well. But in this house I think it just is definitely um, It's, it's created this space for me to speak, and that's with that a burden with it, but a, an honor to do it, because I understand the role. Um, and what I can appreciate is that I do think that our leadership, at least in the Democratic Caucus, sees the Black Caucus um, as a key constituency to the larger caucus, the mm -hmm. larger Democratic caucus, right? They understand that the caucus and my leadership, the, the black caucus and my leadership needs to be at the table, need to be at the table every time. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I try to stress this year in the last year that the black caucus isn't just about criminal justice reform and police brutality. We want to be at the table for all of the decisions we want to be there when you're talking about transportation. We want to be there when you're talking about agriculture. We want to be there when you're talking about, you know, energy and environmental issues. Because in each of those spaces, I can show you where and how black and brown folks um, have been impacted and may have a, a um, opinion about how to move the Commonwealth forward or can play a role in moving the Commonwealth forward. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think that's the great part is that in the last year, I do believe that our leadership has said the Black Caucus needs to be at the table mm -hmm. and have made sure that we are at all the tables in some way. Okay. And even better, we this is the first you know first time in our history we've we've got two we've got these great leaders in our caucus that are leading mm -hmm. the caucus, right? Yeah. Right. We had. Um, last term, anyway, we had three black leaders in the Democratic caucus. You had Rosita Youngblood, Joanna McClinton, and Jordan Harris. It's amazing. And then this year, we continue that leadership with Jordan Harris and Joanna McClinton. So um, seeing black leadership, not just in the black caucus, but in all of the other spaces of leadership in the Capitol. So we are, yes, leading the Democratic caucus, but we're also leading the Philadelphia delegation. We, mm -hmm. we are leading the Allegheny delegation with Austin Davis. Um, we were leading the Southeast delegation with Margo Davis and before she left. And so we were in every space, you know, Women's Health Caucus with Morgan Cephas. So we were in, not just regulated to just quote unquote the black issues. Mm -hmm. We were being seen in all of those spaces as leaders. And I think that is, that is, if anything, is a big achievement in the next, you know, that we're not just limited to K. Leroy Irvis's great leadership, but that we are seeing leaders throughout um, rank and file and all the way, you know, through the entire spectrum of, of um, leadership in this building. Okay. Those are my questions. Do you have, unless there's anything else no, you'd I like to add? No, I can keep talking. You don't want to 